This uh, quite um, beautiful photograph is of my parents on their wedding day on Christmas Eve 1932 in Nazareth. Ironically, uh, they never went back there. My mother had grown up in Nazareth. And I recall very poignantly that during the last few weeks of her illness, she was in Washington at the time, she used to moan quietly that she wanted to go home and, of course, was unable to, and she's now buried in, in Washington. My father, who died about 20 years before she did in Lebanon, had wanted to be buried in a small Lebanese mountain village uh, where we had spent our summers, Dura Shwer, but for reasons having to do with um, national and religious rivalries in the village, he, he couldn't be buried there, and he ended up in a cemetery in Beirut, which is not, not where he wanted to be buried. So, in a way, it's a sort of fate of Palestinians not to end up where they started, but somewhere unexpected and far away. I live in New York. Fifty years after we left Palestine, I've come back with my son Wadir to show him where I was born and where my father, who he's named after, went to school and was a renowned athlete. The fact that I'm ill with leukemia has given this voyage a special meaning. My father was out in 1908 and then three years in the first 11 in cricket where he was a, uh, uh, he was a wicket keeper. And, uh, which means? Which means that you stand behind the... Oh, like a catcher. Yeah, like yeah. a catcher. Oh, I see. He also and played I, four years. Wadi Ibrahim, Wadi Ibrahim, Wadi Ibrahim, Wadi Ibrahim. Jewish terrorists bombed the King David Hotel in 1946. The wreckage could be seen from our house. I recall the rising sense of danger, British soldiers on the alert, and news of impending war between Palestinians and Jewish forces. But my childhood memories of Jerusalem are of a small, mixed city an even smaller Anglican community, peaceful and pleasant, with only occasional reminders that all was not well. As a child of ten, the bombing of the King David Hotel made only a fleeting impression on me. Much clearer was that of a Jewish classmate of mine at St. George's School. This guy, I remember, he was, he was in my class, David Ezra. He was slightly older, yes, I, I remember him very clearly, you mm -hmm. know, from my time, because uh, there, I think there were maybe two Jewish boys in the class, but he was quite striking, he was a bigger fellow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than I was, and he, I sat next to him in the back of a class. Um, and I, it's strange how he stuck in my mind all these years. And that's, that's it. it. Damn it. And then there's nothing after no. that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Yeah. You know. Well, I think that's the way the history stopped for, for, for many of us. It ended there. This is a scene of my sisters and me playing together before my family lost its home in Jerusalem. We used to come here sort of as a, as a daring thing to do because it wasn't, you weren't supposed to go here. I wanted to show and Ibrahim Abu Luhud, my oldest Palestinian friend, the house I was born in. He became a refugee in 1948 and then spent 40 years studying and teaching in the United States. And this is the room I was born in. I don't know what it became. Did they preserve your bed there? No, of course <laughs> not. But I was born in, in the house by my midwife, actually, uh -huh. here. And this, this I remember extremely well because there was a, a balcony on which in the summers we used to sit during the day. Yeah. How old, old were you when you 
you lost for the house? Tw twelve. I was twelve. La uh, December of 1947. When I first came back, after 40 years, I went to every corner of Jaffa. And I walked, literally, I made up my mind that I must end my living in exile. Palestine is still here, and I'm part of this, this Palestinian development, and therefore I can also make a contribution and live in peace with myself in Palestine. But yeah, I'm very curious to know, because you, you were named after my father, and I was born here, and of course, you were born in New York. W what do you feel when you well, see it? Well, uh, it's strange. I mean, I feel, this is where my dad was born. This is uh, my grandfather and my grandmother and my aunts, etc. my, you know, your cousins. Yeah. It's exceptionally strange, and my first impulse is always, can't we get it back? Can't we get it back? And I, 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 you know, it's sort of like beating a dead horse, but I think, is there some way, because I'm studying law, I think, you know, is there some way we could litigate, draw this out, <laughs> maybe get them to give it up, but, you know, I, I, I don't know, I think I'm obsessed, stopped? yeah, I feel, I feel like it's sort of a dead end, it's better not to think that way, but... My connection with Palestine was always intellectual and cultural and as such said spiritual but not physical mm. and I've resigned myself to the loss of this place right. but I still feel right. a moral commitment to it right. because I think it's terribly unjust right. and we've not our, the injustice done to us has never really been acknowledged I mean standing here in front of the house I was born in and that my family owned uh, I mean I want the Israelis to understand that all of us were driven out from places like this. Right. I mean, perhaps not as nice or not as grand, but still, this is our history, and it remains whether they like it or have tried to forget it or not. We lost our family home. Others lost much more during a Nakba, the catastrophe, as Arabs still call it. Um Salah is a survivor of the massacre of Palestinians at the village of Deir Yassin on April the 9th, 1948, which was certainly the most traumatic event of the war and was calculated to spread panic. Twenty-five members of her family were murdered. Four hundred and eighteen Arab villages were destroyed by Jewish forces. Deir Yassin survives as an Israeli mental hospital. Weeks earlier, my son was turned back, but I slipped in unchallenged. This was a scene of such an appalling bloodbath with such horrendous consequences for Palestinians. I was twelve at the time. We were in Cairo already. It was in April of 48. And I remember my aunt, who had just come from Palestine, telling us about it. And that, I think, was part of the design, that the echoes of horror and terror and flight should be a kind of a signal to the Arabs as what would happen if they stood in the way. And it had the desired effect. According to Red Cross reports, about 245 Palestinians were killed on that day in April. One of the results of such events was that 750,000 Palestinians were made refugees, fled or driven out. Among them was a young boy, Mahmoud Darwish, later the Palestinian national poet. I was born and in the Mm-hmm. 
وبالتالي مرجعية ذاكرتي الشخصية وحتى وعلاقتها بالتجربة الجماعية تعود إلى هذا المكان الأول يعني البئر الأولى كانت هناك طبعا القصة أصبحت ذات شأن أو لها أهمية لأنها ارتبطت بخروج جماعي من الأرض Israeli official information maintained for many years that the Arab exodus was voluntary. A generation of Arab and Israeli historians has examined the evidence which tells a different story. One of the leading Israeli figures in this field is Professor Ilan Pape. Palestinians were called upon by the leaders to, to leave. Right. And myself and others have found enough evidence to show both uh, uh, concrete expulsions, but also in a more overall uh, scheme of expulsion, uh, uh, and uh, accompanied by acts of, of massacres, mm. and not only the Dilma so Singh was massacre. A, in your opinion, there is evidence, enough evidence, to show that there was a concerted effort to rid Palestine of its, of its indigenous it inhabitants. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Even now, survivors of the 1948 forced exodus still live in refugee camps such as Dehesha, a stone's throw from Bethlehem. This is the um, Dehesha refugee camp. The uh, Palestinians from uh, the coastal areas and uh, Lid and Ramle, who were driven out by the Israelis, came here, mostly peasants, and initially were given tents by the UN. Over time, as you can see, the tents gave way to houses, which the refugees themselves built. Then after 1967, uh, the Israelis built a fence all around the camp, which is a square kilometer, about 8,000 people stuffed into here, and the fence kept them in. Every inhabitant of Dehesha to get in and out had to go through these metal turnstiles, walking, and then be let back in again, so that the feeling they all had uh, was that they were sort of bottled in here in prison. The important thing about the refugee camp is that it plays a very terrible and unfortunate role in, in Palestinian history because the uh, neighboring countries, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, etc., has camps like this where Palestinians were put as a way of concentrating them in one place and leaving them there until something would be done to them. And nothing was done, of course. And so a whole life grew up in here. The old people, the original inhabitants, many of whom are still here as old people, are still waiting for something to happen, to go back to their towns. Uh, in the instance of some people that we saw and talked to, uh, their land is about 12 kilometers away and they can actually see it. It's now Israel and it's uh, farmed by kibbutzes and uh, towns. And they look at it, in some cases they've gone back to visit and they stand there and cry. It's their land, they'll never get it back, they feel, but they're still waiting. In the meantime, the Heshi goes on. Uh, and there are many other camps like this in the occupied territories. Marhaba. <laughs> Yusuf Laham and Mr. and Mrs. Khalil Laham are old friends and neighbors from the same village near Lidda. They were evicted in 1948, and since the mid-1950s have lived in Dehesha refugee camp, where they've raised their children and grandchildren. Many Palestinian refugees still keep the keys and title deeds to their old homes. They're faithfully preserved over the years, though they can't go back, and many of the houses were destroyed. This 
يعني لو بعد ألف سنة بنموت إحنا بيجوا أولادنا أولاد أولادكم أولاد أولادنا ولو بعد 200 سنة بعد 500 سنة لازم بأمر الله نرجع شايف كيف؟ فيش طريقة ثانية نحن نطالب ما بدون الظلم أبدا طب هلا لا لا لشو بنخلي هالمفتاح انت؟ تذكرة تذكرة مشان الاولاد اولاد آه. الاولاد ما هي ما عندي انا 22 35 ولد يا وبنت اللي بقول يا سيدي اولادي اولاد اولاد اولادي آه. يعني فكرك الكوي بضل كوي؟ لا Refugees from 1948 Palestine, who resettled on the West Bank, were under Jordanian jurisdiction until the 1967 war. Then they came under Israeli military occupation. For those of us who lived in the West, the Arab defeat was particularly shattering and magnified by our distance from it. 67 was actually a watershed for, I think, for all of us in America. What I saw in 67 was totally, totally a unexpected shocking for two reasons. One is obviously the complete dashing of the Arab states and the hope that we had pinned that there will be a battle and we will be liberated and we will be able to go home and so forth. And the way the Arab states were shattered, the armies, I mean, it was unbelievable. I never realized how racist American society was at that moment in terms of the Arabs. How pleased that media uh, uh, showing the pictures of Egyptian soldiers uh, in the desert and so forth. And how, how, how happy they were with this uh, victory of the Israeli army. I realized that there were no voices in America for our point of view. It was at this point, just after the war, that my friend Ibrahim contacted me for the first time in many years and asked me to write an essay called The Arab Portrayed. If the Arab occupies space in the mind at all, it is of negative value. He is seen as the disruptor of Israel's continuing existence, or, in a larger view, a surmountable obstacle to Israel's creation in 1948. Palestine was imagined as an empty desert waiting to burst into bloom. Its inhabitants imagined as inconsequential nomads possessing no stable claim to the land and therefore no cultural permanence. At worst, the Arab is conceived as a shadow that dogs the Jew. Just after the 1967 war, Daniel Barenboim, the celebrated Israeli pianist, was married to Jacqueline Dupre. Among the wedding guests was Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion. I met Daniel in the early 90s, and we've since become close friends, partly because of shared musical interests, partly because 1967 changed our lives. I became very much aware of, of uh, uh, the problems of Palestinian identity and the fact that... How, the, how did you become aware of them? I mean, reading or...? Uh, yes, and, and yeah, in the, sort of in the late, after the 67 war. Mm. I, for me personally, the 67 war was the, the point where I became aware of all that. And then I realized that for the first time in history, uh, the Jewish people were in control of a minor, another minority, having suffered from being a persecuted minority for 2,000 years. Now, for the first time, they were in control of another minority. I didn't like that feeling at all. I remember that as my first feeling, before even understanding the whys and, and, and what for. The stark disparity between Arab and Israeli power was painfully on display in the loss of Jerusalem, which Israel annexed in 1967. Shortly after that, I met Israel Shahak, Hebrew University professor of chemistry, Holocaust survivor, an early and outspoken human rights activist, and a trenchant critic of Israeli treatment of the Palestinians. 
in the 50s and 60s, Palestinians didn't exist. There were only Arabs, and all Arabs were demonized. Uh, Palestinians began to emerge in Israeli Jewish consciousness only at the 70s, and in the bad years of uh, 67 to 73, when really Israeli Jews, uh, and of course Jews in America, mm -hmm. even in Britain even more, uh, were, went mad. Mm -hmm. And they thought that because of the victory in 67, it will all endure forever. And because of this, actually, the civil rights became worse, very much worse than before 67. Feeling forgotten and ignored, some PLO activists turned to spectacular hijackings. Four passenger aircraft were hijacked on man in Jordan in September 1970. In 1972, the Lod Airport massacre in May was followed by the killing of Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics in September. The world took notice, but I've always felt that these actions did more harm than good, and among the Palestinian population at large, failed to engage more people in a truly mass movement. Most Palestinians remained refugees without self-determination, even though our political efforts were rewarded with many, alas not implemented, United Nations resolutions. During the many years that Palestinians have had to endure exile and military occupation, Mahmoud Darwish's poetry gave voice to their anxiety and travail. He was also perceived by the leadership as representing their general view. أنا أعتقد إنه شعري في في آخر عشر سنوات وضع أنسا سؤال القضية الفلسطينية وسؤال الإنسان الفلسطيني وتحول لم وأخطر شيء على الثقافة أخطر شيء على الثقافة الفلسطينية هو أن تبقى موضوعا وليس ذاتا محمود's words found a forlorn echo when I heard that a group of Jahalin Bedouin was being evicted by Israeli soldiers from land they had occupied since 1951. Several of their leaders were also arrested. The Jahalin were displaced from the Negev desert in 1948, and they moved around on the West Bank until they settled near Jerusalem. The soldiers forcibly removed their few possessions, and after the Red Crescent gave them tents, the Israelis returned to confiscate them. This is state-owned land declared in the early uh, 1980s state-owned land. The people here have received uh, dozens of orders to move and they ha after not uh, assisting, we had to do it ourselves yesterday. Now, we arranged an uh, alternative site for these people, a site which has water, a site that has gives them the opportunity to start to start to build. The story of the Jahalin's desolation was hardly mentioned by the media. When I visited them the day after their tents were taken, they were still refusing to move and were sitting in the open without shelter. I'm standing in a place called Bir Maskob, which is uh, translated as the uh, uh, Moscow Well. And it's midway between Jerusalem and Jericho. But just up there uh, is the largest Israeli settlement on the West Bank. We're in the center of the West Bank now. Uh, this is Ma'ali Adumim, which has about 70,000 people in it. And it's constantly expanding. Uh, there's a military post on the other side of this hill. For the last several days, they've been living without shelter. And their, their plight is, well, 
I think the only word for it is tragic, is disastrous. And this, in essence, is the, the Palestinian tragedy, that daily uprootings, daily evictions, daily destruction uh, of, of, uh, of property and homes takes place, and people are powerless to do anything about it. The world has taken very little notice of this, and I must say, I'm, I mean, I'm, it's very, very hard for me to stand here talking about it when I see my own people going through this this endless Calvary without without any relief, without any sympathy or support from the so-called civilized world, which backs Israel in these barbaric, inhuman uh, practices which are scarcely known to the world around. But it is out of these details, look, I mean, the, the, the little bits of plastic, the, the little logs, the bit of railing here, a tin can crushed here. I mean, this is, this is the, 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 these are the atoms out of, the, out of which the tragedy of Palestine is constructed every day, every minute, every hour for 50 years, and it's continuing. And we hear about the peace process, but who is protecting, who is giving these people peace? I, I must say, it's, it's, it's terribly, terribly hard for me to stand here and, and feel so utterly powerless and, and ashamed, really, that I belong to the same human species as these uh, brutes who come and, and dislocate people without, a, without, a, without a, apparently a twinge of conscience. The signing of the Oslo Agreements on the White House lawn in September 1993 was heralded as a new peaceful phase in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But what the public relations hype completely failed to note was that Oslo carefully denied Palestinian self-determination and, in the view of most Palestinians, has created a new system of Israeli-controlled injustice. Oslo was the second largest victory of Zionism, the first was 1948, of course, and uh, it has stabilized a very bad situation in which Arafat regime and Israel cooperate in oppressing Palestinians. Yeah, I look on them as part, of course, big part and inferior part, but part of the same system. Under the Oslo Agreement, the Palestinian Authority now has administrative autonomy in separated areas. About 60% of the Gaza Strip is Palestinian, but Zone A is only 3% of the West Bank. Zone B, which is jointly patrolled, is 24%, and Zone C, 72%, is fully controlled by the Israelis. The status of Jerusalem and Palestinian refugees is simply deferred. Oslo does not mention at all roughly a million Palestinians who are Israeli citizens and whose official designation is non-Jews. They are 20% of Israel's population, but do not have the same privileges as Jewish citizens. A leading spokesman for Palestinian Israelis is Knesset member Azmi Pshara. Oslo hasn't provided the answer, really. I, I think Oslo was not supposed to provide the answer. I don't know why people analyze it as if Oslo was supposed to provide an answer to the, to the crisis of the national movement. It was supposed to provide the answer for the crisis of the PLO. What is being built here is not, in the realities that we face, is not a two-state solution. It is a demographic separation without sovereignty. Now, demographic separation without sovereignty has one name in history. It is called apartheid. It has no other name. I mean, you are separating two groups. One has sovereignty and the other not. Right. This is apartheid. This is not two states. For Jewish citizens, apartheid means new, subsidized, all Jewish settlements like Efrat which is expanding daily near Bethlehem on the West Bank. For Arabs, apartheid works in cruel ways. Near Afrat is the village of Hussein. As elsewhere, Palestinians can neither get permission to build houses, even on land they've owned for generations, nor be certain that their land won't be taken from them. 
I find it heartbreaking to be told that a man can work for 13 years as a laborer to earn the money to build his own house on his ancestral land, inevitably without permission, and come home one day to discover the house bulldozed. That is Mahdi Shusha's story. فبيبقى يعني في دافع اليأس في دافع انتقام شو اللي منعك؟ اللي منعني لأن أنا بفكر بعقلي قبل عاطفتي Palestinian authorities roughly 50,000 guards and members of the security organizations offer no help to the many who endure Mahdi's plight Since Oslo, 10,000 acres of Palestinian land, private and common have been expropriated and 565 houses demolished of Israel is the challenge of our own society. At a conference in Bethlehem held by Sabil, a liberation theology organization, I argued that our national predicament demanded a more radical approach. Like success, failure is made. It's not simply an automatic thing. Failure has to be constructed and worked at until it becomes a habit and a commitment, the way most Arab regimes have been working so hard. It's neither a matter of our genes, sometimes Brahim says that, that's the Arab genes, we're committed to failure, I don't believe it, and it's not a matter of destiny. By the same token, we can commit ourselves to changing our situation, not by force of arms which we don't possess, and cannot foreseeably possess in requisite strength, but by a mass movement of people determined by political, moral, Non-violent means to prevent our further ghettoization and drift. To settle for less, as our leaders have, would be a terrible mistake whose consequences are already evident all around us. Thank you. In the occupied territories, Israeli discrimination against Palestinians is clearly visible. But within Israel proper, discrimination takes subtler but no less severe forms. 92% of the land is for Jews only. This means that Palestinians cannot buy or lease it. But any Jew anywhere has the right to return to it. The law of return is a law which defines citizenship in this country. It's a law for every Jew. Anywhere. Who'd anywhere in the world, whenever he likes to come here, he becomes, the day after he reaches this country, a citizen, without any process of uh, uh, normal immigration. And the Arabs are um, a phenomena which is tolerated in the best case. We are not speaking about a national minority in a normal democratic country. It is the state of the Jews. So it's a country which is... Uh, predefined as the state of n not of the Arab citizen. You know, I live in America and uh, one of the things that uh, is a big subject for discussion is should there or should there not be a Palestinian state. Now the problem with that is is what about you? I mean you're would you go to and live in a Palestinian state? And leave our land? No. Well, I'm asking. No. 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 My parents are uh, born in Nazareth, and I want. I, I, I born in Nazareth, and I want to stay to live in my land. It's my land. And your town. Uh, in my t yes. And uh, what? My I, mother was born in Nazareth. Ah, yeah. yeah. So what's your identity? Exactly. Well, I want to ask you. <laughs> well, I'm, I have no problem with identity. I have many identities. I like that. Yeah. But I'm a Palestinian. I'm an American. I'm an Arab. Yeah, I hope I could feel like I am Palestinian and I am an Israeli at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I want 
what I want and what, what I need that uh, to respect my identity, to have the opportunity to live it, mm-hmm. and to have my rights as an Israeli citizen, mm-hmm. as American citizen, Jewish American citizen gets his rights in America. I don't get it. Can you see a difference between yourself and your, you for example, can you see a difference between your parents and you? Surely I can see a difference. See, they were raised years after we lost Palestine. And I face the fact that we lost Palestine, and I'm living now in a Jewish state. Yeah. I don't like it, yeah. but I'm fighting in my own way uh, to destroy such a thing. To but, you, but you feel it's you, but you feel you belong here. Yeah, right? I feel I belong here. Yeah. And how do you feel about the Israelis who are here? Uh, Israelis, see, Isra- Israelis here are facts yes. that you can't change. I'm not saying I'm gonna put them in the sea or something. Yes. I'm saying that I have to live with Israelis here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live here uh, on the basis of justice. Nowhere is the scarcity of justice for Palestinians more glaringly evident than in Hebron, whose 120,000 Arab inhabitants are at the mercy of 450 well-guarded, militant Jewish settlers who have taken over part of the town. The Cordoba Girls' School, which is located at the division of Hebron's two parts, bears the brunt of settler hostility. مستوطنين بس كان ما لا ما ما كانش ظاهر لا في مسدس صغير آه. كان على جنب اه مسلح مسلحين فالحقيقه احنا سكرنا ابواب المدرسه مم. اللي فوق واللي تحت هو تسلق على جدران المدرسه من الخارج وطال العلم ونزل خلينا كل المشاكل نزل علمكم نزل علمنا العالم فوق بعض هذا العالم له له سنه معلق هذا فيش قانون نزله فيش قانون نزله هذا كان صار زيادة كتير تصرفاتهم بتزيد سوء فنزلوا الطالبات نزلنا مع الطالبات في احتجاج مسيرة احتجاجية على ممارسات المستوطنين احتك فيهم المستوطنين نازلة من البيت على المدرسة تعديت لها محاولة اختطاف من المستوطنين اختطاف؟ اه كيف يعني؟ كنت انا نازلة على كان اولاد ولا لا زلمة كبير بجواب نازل مستوطن كبير انا نازلة من المدرسة حاول انه يختطف هون من تحت يعني الدرج بس لا عندي البيت اه يا هون فحاول انه يختطف مني لما اني انا شردته ومحاولة ناس انهم ساعدونا اه محاولات كثير معنا بتصير في المدرسة بيلتخوا علينا حجار بيحاولوا انهم يضربونا البنات باش اسمه بيضربوا بيساعدوا انهم اولادنا انهم اولادهم يضربونا احنا يصيروا يصيحوا عليكم اكيد او مسيره سلميه في سلمهم هون في يعني احنا كل يوم تقريبا بناكل قتل كيف بده يبقى في حركه سلميه ولا ده يبقى في سلام Hebron's antiquity and its Old Testament status has laid it open to ugly disputes over priority and control. For example, the Ibrahimi Mosque, where Baruch Goldstein massacred 29 Muslim worshippers, is the site of tombs holy to Jews and Muslims, and Israeli soldiers now control divided access to it. The tension in the center of Hebron, caused by the settlers and the Israeli military presence next to the old Kasbah, has left its commerce virtually destroyed. Settlers encroach directly on Palestinian homes in Hebron. Abu Samir and his family have lived in this ancient Arab quarter for generations. Israeli settlers who want to buy property near him want to dislodge him at any price. We're standing on the roof of uh, Abu Samir's house here in the heart of the old city of Hebron. And this line that begins um, on that hill where, the, where those trees are, which is roughly the area of the school, of the Cordoba school, the girls' school, and runs right through along here 
uh, through these uh, build, new buildings, including these rather defiant, not to say aggressive, water tanks. But because the settlers wanted to uh, take this land uh, and claiming that they were threatened by these uh, Palestinian civilians, uh, they built then in the last few weeks basically a kind of a fortified strong point on the top of a, an Arab house where there are soldiers, as one can see, who are there uh, 24 hours a day. So planted right in the middle of it are these, um, well, let's call them whimsical settlers who have decided to uh, camp here and claim this as their uh, own Jewish land. And I think there is one of the uh, paradoxes and ironies of the current situation, because all of this is a result of the um, peace process on which the Palestinian Authority signed on in September of 1993. Different relationships are possible, however. Close Palestinian friends of mine invited Daniel Barenboim and me to dinner at their West Bank home. The next night, at his packed Jerusalem recital, attended by his Palestinian hostess, Barenboim movingly dedicated this first encore to her, to applause from the Israeli audience. The only way for me that this can be solved now is saying, we are here, this is the land that is available, what is the best way that we can live in it? And I believe in a, only in this kind of uh, pragmatic vision to the future, and not looking back uh, with historic and not to speak of religious rights. I think you and I agree on one thing, namely that the idea of separation is simply a kind of fiction. But I don't agree with you about the, the role of history. I mean, I think history has to be taken into account because there are historical wounds that, as a people, we feel that have to be, um, that have to be understood, just as there are historical experiences of Jews that we have to understand as well. I mean, as if each of us takes account of the other's history, um, then I think we can move towards reconciliation. I think the principle of Zionism is still absolutely correct for the Jewish people. The price that it has exerted is, is another subject, but it is absolutely correct, provided it continues to develop. In other words, if you make Zionism, the idea of Zionism, what it was in 1947, or in 45, or even in 48, at the creation of the State of Israel, and leave it as such, it will only be a negative force. It is absolutely essential for an Israeli leader to have the vision uh, that he has to start with a symbolic gesture. And then the rational conclusions will be achieved. But the symbolic gesture towards, the towards the Palestinian, this uh, a symbolic gesture is now absolutely uh, essential. And I don't, unfortunately, I don't, I don't uh, see it from the, from the present uh, government. Something else will emerge because people would recognize the futility of the Oslo Agreement. Oslo contained from the beginning the seeds of its own destruction. The conditions that prevail today... You uh, mean with the Netanyahu government? Of course. I think are exacerbating and, and making much more clear to Palestinians and presumably to Israelis who accept the Palestinian right to sovereignty mm. in their territory, because there is a camp there mm -hmm. that accepts the Palestinian reality and therefore can accept statehood. Yeah, like Baron Boyd, for yeah. example, says it open. I mean, and, and, and others too. I mean, there is a segment there, just as there has been development on our side, there has been development on their side. But I think both of these sides are being undermined by the Palestinian acquiescence to the unrest terms of Oslo, and they are terrible, and the extremist policy which is articulated by Netanyahu and the Likud. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, and, and that the is bound, the religious parties. And, that, and that is bound in the conditions of the Arab world uh, to, to produce uh, further conflict.
we have stolen too much of the Palestinian land. Look on the situation around Jerusalem, where the Jewish settlements. Of course I recognize this is a stolen land, but I also recognize that 250,000 Jews are living now of, this, of that stolen land. You cannot expel them. You cannot uh, turn the wheel back. You can make justice. Mm. Exactly as it was made in South Africa. There was no turning the wheel back, but attempted more and more justice. The actuality, though, is ever more injustice, as more land is taken every day for bypass roads and settlements. Inhuman and unjust, and you know it. You're a decent person, I can tell. These are poor people, you're taking their land away from them. You know that to be true. You don't feel that, huh? We were driving along and saw uh, a bulldozer bulldozing this field right here. I stopped there and I started talking to the villagers who were, of course, in extreme consternation that their land was being destroyed and taken from them. And all of them said that uh, they had never been given warning, not been told this was going to happen. Uh, but the group of Israeli soldiers told me the following. Their story is that this land is being cleared for a road, which is mostly, they say, used by Palestinians. And I said, well, what about this big road here? He said, yes, yes, and the settlers use it too. I said, exactly. So what do you need another even bigger road, which is obviously about 100 meters wide? So then they said, well, this is done by arrangement with the Palestinian Authority. I said, well, wh where is the evidence for this? He said, well, you should talk to the headman of the village, the Mukhtar, a man called Abu Isa, who's nowhere to be found. And he knows about this, and he arranged it with the cooperation of the Palestinian Authority. So I asked the soldiers, I said, well, whatever you think you're doing, you're obviously destroying people's land. He said, it's not their land, it's land of the state of Israel. I said, well, what kind of, how could that be? I mean, these people have been working this land for hundreds of years. He said, yes, but you know, it's part of progress. We build planes, spaceships, cars, roads. This part of development. I said, yeah, but they haven't been compensated. He said, yes, they have. I said, who paid them? He said, I don't know. The striking thing is you could go anywhere, anytime on the West Bank and see events like this, land being taken on a daily, on an hourly basis from Palestinians, number one. And number two, the utter defenselessness of Palestinians in the face of this powerful machine just slowly robbing and dispossessing them of their land. And they have no recourse. They say they, they have a case in court right now, but by the time they get there, of course, the land's gone and there's nothing they can do. The crops are ruined uh, and their hope for the future is pretty much destroyed. I mean, that's the essence of the problem we face as a people today.